like collecting money. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay, we came for you. We came to support you. My name is Louise Chegwidden. I'm here because I'm human and I'm on planet Earth and we need clean air without part particles of toxins that get into people's lungs and create a massive public health problem. I'm a healthcare professional and oh, massive asthma rates in the Bay Area in the refinery corridor and um, cancers and we are waiting around to say, well, the, the same as with the, the, the tobacco industry, that we let that go on for decades. The, the refineries, the Exxon, Exxon knew, they all know. They all know that, that we're on borrowed time here, that we have to get rid of the fossil fuels, that we, we have the capacity already to go to sustainable, renewable energy and it's just we're lacking the will and part of it is the people who are making money from the status quo want it to stay that way and we i'm here as as a citizen as um, a citizen of the world uh, like i said an air breather and standing up for all life on this planet all the people and all the the plants and rivers and water sources that that can't speak so i'm here to say no, we have to make the, these caps as they were initially uh, written and this last minute change to up the, the, uh, the limit of emissions to 24% higher than what they currently are at is just unconscionable. It's a last minute effort to, um, to create greater pollution before the limits get set. The, the staff? That's a good question. You'd have to ask the staff. I, I, I'd, love, I'd love to get in there and say, okay, can we see all the staff put their hands up? Let's see who you are because you are recommended. I mean, I've been to these meetings many times and the staff are all chatting with all the, the industry people. They're not chatting with us. They don't come over and say, hey, hi, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? They're chatting with the industry people. So take that from that what you will. Actually, I've seen, I've seen a nice shift because of what, what's been happening at the state level. They've been able to use that as a wedge, as a way of being able to say, this is the way California is going, this is the direction we need to go in, and that the board has taken support from that to, to say we need to, to cap. That, that's, they've been given a, a, a little push to, to really set these limits. So I think the staff is pushing back at the last minute about that and we're here to say to the board, no, nope, you're going the right direction, keep going. They're here to represent us and we're here to say, we're here to watch you. We're here to say, do the right thing. I'm Megan Zapanta and I'm a community organizer with the Asian Pacific Environmental Network in Richmond, California. Um, and I'm here today to continue to call continue again for years and years and years to call for real caps on refinery emissions. How long have you been working on this issue? Um, APEN, I mean APEN's been working around the refinery and limiting pollution and the health impacts on our communities for almost 25 years now in Richmond, um, but it, we've been fighting for this since the 2012 Chevron refinery fire that sent 16,000 people, including many, many of our members, to the hospital, um, and we continue to fight for the for the health of our members, many of whom are, are, are who are Laotian refugees. Um, many, How is this pollution affected them? Mm -hmm, many of whom, community? many of whom are, have a lot of pre-existing conditions. We have so many like cases of cancer, of asthma, of uh, deaths in our community, and so you know, so this is really a question of life and death. And do you think that these uh, refineries can be counted on to clean things up and to make run properly so people aren't going to be contaminated? No. 
<laughs> absolutely not. I was going to think about it for a second. No. Our members, they say time and time again, if you ask them, like, oh, do you think, what would you want to inspect, you know, like, what do you want Chevron to do? And they're like, we want to inspect the refinery. We don't trust them. We don't trust them to regulate themselves. We, you, they really, really want our government to be able to, um, to be able to speak for us, to protect and put, um, put, our, mem put our communities and our public lives first. I'm with the climate justice uh, group in uh, SEIU Local 10 to 1, and um, we're hoping that the uh, board is going to consider how to protect people's health and welfare and uh, give, what, give us what everybody wants, which is clean air. They uh, have voted to um, be in favor of the San Francisco Employees Retirement System pension board to divest from all fossil fuel companies. So we want clean climate for everyone and jobs, good jobs, and justice for workers. There's Part of the reason I'm here is because of uh, people that have already died from the climate crisis. And I want to speak in behalf of the people that are dead who have been impacted already by fires and floods and famine. Those people would have something to say about people that work at Shell and Tessero and Chevron and Exxon. And they would probably say, I imagine, that it's important to have a job, but it's even more important to have a good job that's not dependent on hurting people and causing misery to impoverished peasants in the third world. Well, I, one of the things I'm confident about is that the uh, big business oil companies will be for sure spending lots of money on PR and greenwashing and propaganda to make their position seem like they're in favor of uh, cleanliness and good jobs and uh, clean air for everyone. But what the actions they take, that's what's important. And who is SEIU 1021? Why don't you talk about the union? Introduce yourself, please. All right. Uh, I'm David Page. I'm with the Service Employees International Union, Local 10 to 1, which is uh, the San Francisco Bay Area local. Um, we're in uh, various parts of Northern California. Uh, we have uh, nurses, social workers, uh, BART workers, all kind of uh, people. It's many thousands in our uh, local right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm also representing San Francisco Bay Area Physicians for Social Responsibility, which I'm president of. I'm also past president of our national organization, and locally I'm speaking for about 2,500 health professional members of our organization. Uh, many of us, I was part of a team that was here the last time speaking with the public uh, health uh, panel that detailed the significant uh, health impact of uh, climate change that we're trying to deal with by having a strict and important cap here. And uh, just to very quickly reiterate those issues, they include the issues of acute and chronic lung disease, cancer, all the sorts of things that are attributed not only to the greenhouse gas issues themselves, but the related fossil fuels. And for this reason, we were advocating also having a cap on particulate matter and to have a strong environmental uh, impact report with the health assessment because of those issues. However, we left here last time expecting a strong cap and we conceded having the other issues, but there's a bit of a little bit in our view, a little bit of a big switch. We estimate, based on the CBE estimates, that the changes in rules would result in anywhere from 300 to 500 deaths over the lifespan of the project, which roughly comes to a valuation of 2.6 to 4.4 billion dollars. We also think that uh, the significant, this would lead to significant increase, uh, tantamount to having additional refinery uh, being put in, in the area of 2.6 million tons per year or 1.05 billion tons over a 40 year lifespan of these uh, projects. This uh, increment, we believe, uh, due to the new plans, would certainly contribute to local uh, adverse climate related health impacts including increased mortality, injury, morbidity, 
lost productivity and activity related to increases in extreme heat, uh, wildfires, air pollution, flooding, landslides, impaired water and food security, sea rise and weakened essential health infrastructure, all which has been amply documented. It's interesting in looking at today's San Francisco Chronicle, which detailed uh, these proceedings being wrapped in the background of what we see are the real impacts of climate change already unfolding, such as in the Southwest where cars are too hot to drive, where airplanes are being canceled. We can look back at the last week, the wildfires in Portugal, because we have to deal with the global impacts of these things that are melting 65 odd people in their cars. And we also have to think of uh, global impacts and the sort of 65 million people who are displaced around the world, much of this due to climate change. I get the issues. We all get the issues that other people have spoken to about the impacts on jobs. But this is not West Virginia. We could do a lot better in this area by providing the jobs to deal with the real concerns. My son is a member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, and they have been able to have some ingenuity in Contra Costa being able to develop thank, plans thank with the Bay Area. So we call on you to protect health thank you for and restore today. the old standards. Do refineries actually have a vested right to pollute? Because that's the same thing when we say operate at maximum permitted levels. We should know that this April, a California State Appeals Court heard a lawsuit brought by the Chamber of Commerce against the Air Resources Board. The Chamber was arguing that cap and trade is a form of unfair taxation. Okay? The court not only dismissed that argument, but made another extremely important ruling on the scope of industry's vested rights. The court argued, and I quote, Plaintiffs seem to rely on the foundational premise that covered entities have some vested right to pollute, uh, uh, to continue polluting California's air. But, it goes on to say, contrary to suggestion by plaintiffs, implicit or otherwise, there is no vested right to pollute in California. My name is Irene Friedman. I have been a registered nurse for 17 years, primarily in emergency medicine and pediatrics. The 90,000 members of California Nurses Association and I call on you to once again uphold and reaffirm your historic decision from last month. As nurses, we see the effect of rising pollution levels on our patients, including but not limited to increased cases of respiratory and cardiovascular disease, especially in infants, children, seniors, low-income communities, and communities of color. The frontline communities less than two and a half miles from refineries predominantly low-income low communities of color, the mortality rate is 8 to 12 times the rest of the Bay Area. For nurses, these are not mere statistics and numbers. They are the patients, families, and neighbors we care for on a daily basis. There is no valid reason to risk this severe and potentially irreversible harm to our health and climate. We call on you to once again show leadership on this important issue to stand with the communities you represent and protect the health of your constituents. We urge you to adopt the refinery emissions caps as developed over these past five years, which an overwhelming majority of the board voted for and the staff supported on May 31st. We strongly urge the, urge the board to reject the increasing emission allowances proposed by staff last week and for you to take the final step of adopting Rule 1216, the refinery caps on GHG. Thank you. Uh, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, said once a long time ago, if I was to become a worker tomorrow, the first thing I'd do is join a union. And that's what we've done. We've joined unions. And there's 35,000 of us in Contra Costa County. And from where we sit, our view on this uh, proposed rule change is that it has the potential, the unintended consequences, of having enormous impacts on jobs. These jobs are middle class jobs, hard working men and women who go out there every day and, and put in their eight for eight. And they get paid well, they get benefits, they get pension, they uh, live in, they're your neighbors, friends, family. And those people are counting on us to make sure that we are paying close attention to what the impact of this rule could have on jobs. I uh, thank uh, Director Ross for bringing up the issue of socioeconomic. We take issue with the staff. We think they've uh, 
they've gone in the wrong direction. We happen to think that capital improvements will go in the opposite direction. And when that happens, we're talking about uh, tens of millions of work hours every year, tens of millions of work hours. No one's going to invest capital improvement monies into their facilities if they don't know what the future holds for them. Uh, our workers uh, support clean air, and uh, we support uh, working on improving our climate, and we think that we need to have a situation where we uh, have more time to talk, so we're asking for a delay and uh, hopefully a dialogue to talk about socioeconomic impacts. Thank you. Men and women throughout California, and our members are your constituents. One of the areas that uh, is a big concern to all of us is the social and economic impacts of uh, this uh, rule. And uh, I firmly disagree with your, your staff recommendation because I think the uh, construction portion of it has been glossed over. You know, we are the people that promote local hire, apprenticeship, and career opportunities for men and women in the Helms to Hard Hat program. And something that always gets overlooked is for every one construction worker you see out there in the streets, there's three secondary jobs that always get overlooked. And these are the huge impacts that I don't think that has been addressed in its entirety in this report. In 1992, uh, in Contra Costa County, working with Supervisor Joy and, and Mitchoff, we established a, a labor enviro coalition, and it exists today. And we were always able to address the social and economic issues as well as the environmental issues. And it's been a proven and it's been successful. Last, uh, yesterday in the state building trades, uh, we took a look at what's happening with the cap and trade issues, which is really critical. And, you know, my concern is, is that, you know, it's, you know, taking a position today could be really premature. Uh, the state building trades is working closely with uh, the governor's office, and as of right now, until you know all these issues are addressed in the entirety, and I think you should be you know, dealing directly with your state's legislative representatives as well. And until you know the complete social and economic impacts of the project, I think it's premature to move forward today. The broadcast on the water. Is Are you with Shell here? Are you going to speak here? Yes, we are. Are you talking about your concerns here? Oh, oh no, thank you, but I appreciate the opportunity. Are you thank you. Are you to talk? Are you we defer to Ann here. I defer to Ann. Ann, can you say why you're here? So, we, we all want to be part of the public process. And, uh, thank you. What does that mean? I appreciate your time and your inquiry, and we will save our comments for inside. I understand. So, I make strong relations for Shell, yeah. He's really shy. So, no, I think, like I said, we all want to be part of the public process. So, it's good that there are a lot of people here. I'm, in, I'm for all of us having a voice and being able to discuss with the Air District for good rulemaking processes. So, are you opposing or supporting the recommendation of the staff? I guess, again, I'm, I'm, I'm for a transparent rulemaking process. Uh, my name is Stephen A. Dell. I'm with the Sunflower Alliance. And we've been fighting many of these individual fossil fuel projects for the last four or five years that want to expand bringing dirty crude into the Bay Area. And this is the fight that could really stop the refineries from processing the, the really dirty crude like the Alberta tar sands that's going to have such an enormous impact on the climate and the health. And if we can stop stop it at all these refineries, that's the first in the nation. And you know, even the California Air Board is saying we're doing the right thing to bring their clean air program forward. So, you know, the whole thing today is to get the staff to um, accept what everybody is telling them, put a real cap in them that's going to keep the refineries operating at their current level. It's not going to cost any jobs. It's not going to stop any fuel. It's not going to cost gasoline shortages in California. It's just going to cap the refineries where they are today. So as we go forward with, with uh, climate programs in, in California, we can reduce our greenhouse gas and our air pollution. So uh, apparently at the uh, last minute they've decided to increase the level of uh, acceptable pollution. What is that all about? 
Well, they're claiming that they've, they've issued permits for projects that are not completed or not, not even started, that they have to allow the refineries to operate at whatever level they want. And so they've added these huge additions to the existing uh, emissions. And um, what are we talking about? Is, is that a lot of increase? Um, well, the games they're playing, um, they came out originally and with something that was 25% higher than the emission cap. It was the equivalent of adding a completely a sixth refinery to the Bay Area at the scale of our, our largest refineries. So they're talking about increasing limits so you could have a sixth refinery. In, in effect, the five refineries could, could increase their emissions to that level. Um, and so they knew, they knew we hated that. We, they knew that wouldn't go through. So at the last minute, they played the, well, let's split the baby game. And they cut that in half. And the, so it's only a t 15 or 20 percent increase. It's like a smaller refinery being added. So it's, it's totally un unacceptable. And it's not even legally defensible by the law. If they made such radical changes, they'd have to do a new environmental impact report to justify that significant a change. Um, so we're just telling the board, you know, just stay with what you voted on last month and let's get this done. And who is this staff? I mean, uh, the, the board is supposed to be in charge of the staff. Right. I mean, the, the staff is, you know, it's, it's the te technical experts, it's the, the manager, and it's the lawyers. And the lawyers are, are one of the biggest black, you know, we, the lawyers have been telling them they can't do this, that it's going to interfere. And even this, this attorney general and the California Air Board are telling them that your lawyer is full of it. Um, so, is this a captured agency? Um, some people think it is. Some people might argue about that. Uh, you know, um, it is a democratically run agency in the sense that has an elect. Uh, it, its board of directors are elected officials that are responsible to the public, and so that's been our campaign to uh, demand that the board, the elected representatives, do their democratic duties and they are the managers and it's their responsibility there's the case of uh, Michael Bachman and Sarah Steele who were fired for opposing the destruction of documents what does that connection between this and what's happening I mean, we don't know uh, what the connection is but you know it, it says something about um, in, in any agency like this the people who are working on the ground floor that are developing rules, implementing policy, carrying out um, um, the, 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 the work of the, of the agency, they rely on their managerial staff to have their backs and to support them. So if you have the top managers that are not willing to, to take the, a leading position and defend their, their workers and defend their um, agency, then then you have a board that is effectively captured. Um, and so, I mean, I think it reflects on, on whether, whether the rank and file working people in the agency can trust their management. To I mean, it seems there would be a reign of fear if workers are fired for doing their job trying to protect the documents. Yeah, yeah, I mean, or if, if that's what happens, or um, if, work, if, if people who are trying to develop or implement rules feel that um, they're not, their, their legal staff is not going to defend what they're doing against the oil companies, then they're going to be cautious. They're going to become hyper-cautious. Um, so it's, it's, in an agency like this, it's, it really depends on, on having effective leadership because if you don't have that, you know, the rank and file have real problems carrying out their work. you have a concern that none of the elected board members have called for uh, independent investigation by the Attorney General Xavier Bacera about the firing of these workers? I, I don't know enough about that, that issue to, to know what, what's been going on with the board. I haven't discussed that issue. Have you heard in, any of the board members call for an investigation? Um, not that I'm aware of. Hello, I'm Susan Christie, Ph.D. My first interest is for our grandchildren and the generations to come that they have a livable planet, that it is not polluted, it is cool enough. 
Secondly, I am appalled that at the last minute, some members of the staff seem to have shifted what the board agreed upon, which was 7% leeway in this CAPS, changed it four times more to 24%, which means there are basically no limits on the amount that the refineries and the chemical companies can pollute. It's very distressing to see this last minute bait and switch. And who does the board represent? Why would they do that? Apparently people are surprised about that. How could this take place without proper going through a process and letting people know that they had plans to change the uh, limits of uh, pollution? My understanding is that the change came from, I believe it's Jack Broadbent, and the staff. Now the staff are people who work for the state, but in the corporations, the refineries and the chemical companies, and they begin like regulators all over the, com of the country to identify with the people who they see every day rather than with the quality of the air and the environmentalists. Here they're the staff of the air quality district, but they often represent the people in the corporations. They seem to have a conflict of interest because who they hear from are the corporate people. You think this is a captured agency? I, it's been captured by these corporations which are supposed to regulate? I believe that the Air Quality Board staff has done many good things over the years. They are not our enemy, but on the CAPS issue, I think they have been influenced very strongly. I'm concerned about that. Let's not demonize either the people or uh, the staff in general, but this CAPS issue is really important. Hi, I'm Linda Hutchins-Knowles with Mothers Out Front. Should I spell my name? And so what's going on here today and you're pretty upset about what's happening? Yeah, we are very concerned. I represent a group of mothers and children that are mobilizing for a livable climate. And we believe this is a truly life or death decision that the board is making today. Because with increased um, emissions, we're gonna have more premature deaths. Our children are suffering from asthma and other health effects. Also, we'll have more premature deaths due to climate impacts. So we're here to mobilize um, action for protecting our children's future. And it seems like there are continuous and ongoing releases of toxic chemicals from these plants, it's been going on for decades. Uh, why hasn't this agency act to stop these toxic releases and, and the health problems that are resulting as a result of that? Um, I think that they are influenced um, by many different constituencies. Certainly they've been trying to do the right thing, I believe, for our children. But I think there's also the influence of the fossil fuel industry, which is basically called the third house here in California. So somehow, I don't know the background story to it, but I understand that the staff has inserted language into this bill that would actually do the opposite of what it was intended. It would weaken the controls rather than increase them. Now, a couple of months ago, uh, Michael Bachman and Sarah Steele, who were two workers here, were fired after they protested the destruction of pollution control documents by the executives. Are you aware of that and are you concerned that uh, basically the executives haven't been held accountable for uh, re retaliating against employees who are trying to do their job? I actually can't comment on that. I don't know anything about that. Michael Heisinger. This hearing is going to determine whether the oil refineries get to continue polluting the bay. Uh, today we're having a board of directors meeting at the Air District. To so today is the um, Air District Board of Directors meeting where we are discussing a number of issues including Regulation 12, Rule 16, which is going to um, look at regulating greenhouse gases or capping greenhouse gases from refineries. How would it change the rules? Some of the people here are complaining that they're going to increase the amount of pollutants being released in the air as a result of this proposed change? That's a mischaracterization of what's going on. What actually is happening is we've actually set a cap that takes into consideration what their current emissions are as in addition to the emissions that they would have if the permits, the projects that they have in the pipeline that aren't actually turned on yet were, were realized. And so um, the part of the issue we had with the community proposed rule was that the, the um, limits were unrealistic and we would get sued in court and the whole thing would have been turned out. You're saying that the state attorney general, Xavier Becerra, has said you won't be sued. 
I, I, the general has, has said statement. I don't. I don't have that. I, I've got. I don't. I don't have information on that. Um, uh, there's a concern here also about employees who've been retaliated against uh, for whistleblowing. Uh, Michael Bachman and Sarah Steele, who were fired, uh, they were protesting the destruction of documents, uh, pollution records. Uh, do you have a concern about that? And has there been an independent investigation outside this agency about uh, the destruction of documents? There is an ongoing investigation about that, and there has been no destruction of documents. In fact, we have all the documents that have been um, allegedly uh, that they that the. Uh, the two uh, former employees say were destroyed. So there has been no destruction of documents. Why, why were they fired? I don't have that information. Has the attorney general been investigating their firing? I don't know about that one. I don't know about that one. Your, your agency is being sued, though, by as a result of their firing. By by those two, yes, by those two individuals, it is being. We are under. Uh, we are in a lawsuit. Are you concerned that there might be a fear of intimidation of employees here at this agency if workers feel that they're going to be fired if they do blow the whistle on what's going on at the agency? Absolutely not. We have a strong whistleblower policy, and we actually would abide by it. And I think that this is a very reasonable place to work, and people are treated very fairly, and 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 their complaints and concerns are taken seriously. Well, these employees said they were bullied here. They were intimidated and they were told not to speak out about the destruction of uh, pollution control documents. I understand that that's their side and I think that the Air District has a, a different side and, and I do not believe that that is, is what occurred. A few important tenets that we operate with. One is take the time to do things right. So I really want to stress that we want to go and make sure that everything is done properly. And then the other thing is, is also making sure that we have the, involve the right people before you make decisions. So making sure that you have the right information, the right knowledge, and the right people to help make those decisions. Let's make sure we have all that. So one of the things the staff report presented was the, uh, they had shown some charts around PM, and I wanted to show what the error around Richmond looks like. So if you can see on the screen right now, it shows that you know, we had a really nice thing, you know, I'm very proud of this, is that you know, we met the federal air standards, you know, 35 micrograms per cubic meter. So I was a little bothered by seeing this chart, you know, showing thousands. And I do want to make sure that people understand, you know, this was presented at the last board meeting, and it shows nanograms per cubic meter. So that's multiplied by a thousand. So that 35 would be way off this chart. So just make sure that you have the right information to present this. So next. So um, we're going to put the uh, consent calendar. Uh, two standard deviations for operational variability, and those standard deviations are standard and engineering practice and accepted statistical methodologies for incorporating variations. And we added emissions for permitted projects that are not fully either built or operational. I just want to say that, that I am concerned um, both about the content and about the process. And um, the, I was just doing the math in response to uh, Commissioner uh, Joya's question, and for most of the lines, using two standard deviations uh, comes out at more than 7%. And for some of them, it comes out at about 7%. For some of them, it's about 10 or 20%. And does not the standard deviation take into account times when the refinery may have been out of compliance? So they emitted more on a given day because something went wrong. The, the standard deviation represents operational... Actual operations. Operational. Not, not allowed emissions, but actual emissions. Actual emissions. So in other words, if someone was misbehaving, we would be rewarding that. Also, if somebody was... Actually, for the first time ever, explicitly allow increased refinery emissions. So... That's about the permit program. I, I have three points to make about the evidence in the record that I think conclusively shows that the May 31st caps um, are the most legally defensible approach that you have in front of you today. And these are scientific points. First, you have the facts for your finding of need. The technical rationale staff presents for increasing the emission limits, 
these increases you see here, there, um, they document a clear and urgent need for the CAPS to plug an intransigent loophole in the district's permitting system that staff now asserts will result in very large emissions increases without these performance-based caps. Again, as Claire Brunda said, performance-based caps are fundamentally different from allowances based on guesstimates of what unused permit equipment might emit in the future. And that's what we're proposing. Our position, just to be clear, adopt the May 31st caps replace that section 301 with section 301 in the proposal before you. Do that today if possible. We absolutely oppose the pollution increases based on this vested pollution right. So this table I won't go into in great detail, but note that it actually compares apples with apples. The emissions, the actual emissions maximum from CARB data compared with the apples, the maximal limits. And you add that up, you, you get Four million. Time. I'm sorry, but um, I, I I would like to ask the chair to please indulge me. This is um this is a serious process issue. There's a tremendous amount of fundamentally different information. I can be very quick. Um, Mr. Karras, you're going to have have to put another group together and come back later because I'm going to move this along and you you have had the time allowed. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I need to formally protest on behalf of CBE that our, our right to, to engage with the last minute Please. fundamental change. Mr. Karras, as the chair. I will, not, I will not dispute you on the time. My name is Ron Espinoza with the United Steelworkers. I am the sub-district director for the state of California for District 12. And you're here at this uh, hearing today about uh, refinery limits of pollution. What are your concerns about what's going on with these limits and what the uh, new staff is doing at this agency? My concerns is that they are, <clears throat> they may have unexpected consequences from it that it hasn't been totally vetted, and we need to make sure that there's some kind of measurement to see what they are putting in place actually does what they're we're hoping and doesn't uh, change the carbon footprint. Uh, that's our position. We think that uh, they haven't looked at it hard enough, and give it some give it. Um, we need need some kind of checks for it. And the refineries uh, have violated health and safety regulations uh, for many years, or, and yet uh, it doesn't seem to be there any accountability. I mean, what, where do you stand on uh, these toxic releases? It seems like it's a continuous problem, flaring and accidents one after another. Well, our, our position is that the, the, the people that we represent are good workers. We should keep things in the pipe. You should be making it safer. Uh, I know people are concerned about tar sands and various other things. Whatever crude you're running, whatever product you're doing, the safety, the, the companies need to keep stuff in the pipes and keep it from being released. We believe in that. We support that. We are co-founders of the Blue Green Alliance, the United Steelworkers. So we've had a long history of being in favor of um, re reducing pollution and having clean air, clean water in a clean environment. Now in California, 18 and a half million workers are only about 200 OSHA inspectors. Uh, workers who are in a union situation or have some better protection with a union contract, but if you're in a non-union situation, which the majority of workers are in, uh, what kind of protection do you have for speaking out about health and safety? <laughs> you talking about if you're non-union? Non well, one of the things the union does is give you a voice, but um, the fact that there are so few limits their ability to get out to everything that occurs. And the, the other issue is that workers can be very easily intimidated when they don't have any backing and uh, they're at will employees. So uh, if you go down into the, the warehouse districts and others in Southern California, even up here, uh, people are being treated badly, poorly, things that are totally unsafe and they're un unable to reach out and get help for it. So, I mean, there needs to be more, more OSHA inspectors and we need to be responding to more things. And it should be criminal to intimidate employees or, or have them prevent them from making statements or things to OSHA for the safety of, I mean, people should come to work, be able to do their work and go home safely. Now the stress in the Bay Area, the whole health and safety situation, people working many hours, having to commute, they can't afford to live in the Bay Area. A lot of workers are having to commute in the valley. How is that affecting your members at the refineries and as far as just trying to make it in the Bay Area as a refinery worker? Well, most, most people, even though a lot of our members make a fairly decent wage, they still have to have two incomes in this Bay Area. Um, 
and uh, most refinery workers work shift work and life's tough they don't always see their families and both both parents are usually working so um, myself uh, it was tough when I was in the refinery um, it, it's it's a um, you know there there's costs are, are huge families have changed when I was a kid my mother didn't have to work but today it's almost impossible to not to succeed here in the Bay Area without two incomes. Now there's also the issue of health care for workers I mean they're paying more and more of their wages for health care and also the public a lot of people have testified here that they have asthma just getting health care in California there's a single-payer bill um, that would cover everyone what's your view about the issue of health care in California what what needs to be done about it? Well, the single-payer single bill was always the thing that we wanted was a single-payer um, health care. And uh, unfortunately, they, they labeled the Affordable Care Act uh, Obamacare because it was pol politically incest. At the end of the day, Affordable Care Act was on the road to doing the right thing. And right now, we have no clue where it's going to go. And there are thousands and thousands of people that may have no coverage at all, uh, people at risk. and. Uh, uh, the whole country's uh, in a problem with health care. And labor is, seems to be under a frontal attack. Uh, they're getting rid of labor regulations. They want to uh, basically bust the public employees' unions, take away agency shop. Uh, how do you see labor responding to this kind of political economic assault that they're facing? Well, we're, the, we're in the biggest war we've ever been since back in the creation of unions. And it's, it's here again, and we've got to continue to speak the right with the right voice, we've got to keep reaching out to people to understand labor and what labor means and <clears throat> how we uh, politically get involved to be able to change the, the dialogue because um, there are more working class people than there are people that are one percenters.